thanks very much. Thank you, thank you, Nicola, and and thank you all for for staying around for the last session of the afternoon. Uh, you would, Nicola just said. Um, the, the, the sequence of presentations is going to be in ascending <coughs> order of specificity and that's probably good for me because I think my job is then probably the easiest, which is just as well because looking, looking at the, the assembled luminaries of finance ministries present and past, I, I have to repeat what, Car what Carlos was saying in the morning that it, it feels a little bit like there's any number of people who could be sitting here on this panel and probably would have just as much and maybe more to add to, to this particular question. So without further ado, what do we know about finance ministries and does it really matter? I, I should also add that when I say finance ministries, I'm just using that as a generic term, which to me is just slightly easier pr to pronounce than central finance agencies. I basically mean the same thing. Now, we've, we've heard a lot about the context in which this is an interesting question a potentially an important question all through the morning. This discussion between tools and instruments on the one hand and then the organizations, institutions, people on the other hand, the, the, the nagging sense that some of us have that maybe a little bit too much attention has been paid to the one and not enough to the other. There's also a different, slightly different but closely connected discussion about the the technical domain of public financial management versus the, the non-technical factors that shape budgeting and PFM. It, it always makes me cringe a little bit to talk about non-technical factors because that just makes it sound a little bit more fuzzy or more poorly defined as though if uh, as soon as something becomes technical then it's, it's something specific that we can deal with and I think that's also something that is worth challenging. And then finally um, there's an interesting contrast, I think, that if you if you look at public financial management versus public administration, public administration is a very well established academic discipline where at every decent university that has a social science department, you have tons of people doing research on public administration, yet issues such as civil service reform, organizational restructuring, <coughs> incentives of, of staff and all of those things are not really all that fashionable in, in international development anymore, certainly not as much as they used to be in the 1990s, whereas in, in with public financial management, it's almost exactly the opposite, that we didn't find it all that difficult to assemble 100 people in this room and, and a significant audience online, but if you wanted to look at different universities, literally the, the, the public finance sort of teaching and research community, half of it is probably going to be here. Mm -hmm. So the other half of the globe better not fall sick at this world. Nobody should do anything to this building right now because otherwise the teaching of PFM is going to be significantly mm -hmm. affected in the next <laughs> semester. <laughs> and it is just something interesting to reflect upon. Is it because we are just getting our priorities slightly wrong? Is it because the people in the academic ivory tower are paying attention to the wrong things? Something to keep in mind. I'm going to start out um, with the, the sort of the first metaphor, um, and as so often a picture probably says more than a thousand words, is this old tale of the, the six blind people or the several blind people and the elephant who are, who are looking at this thing, this, this beast that they don't really understand and everyone is trying to touch and figure out from a different part of the entire thing what the whole beast might be looking like. And so the person who is, who's is tugging at the tail was going to say, well, this, this elephant is, is something like a snake. It's, it's, it's like a ropey, thin kind of thing. And the, the, the person who is, who's, who's standing next to one of the legs is going to say, well, it's, 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 it's like a tree. I don't quite know what it is. And then someone who, the, the other one who's tugging at the tusk is going to say, this is a fearsome beast that has gigantic teeth and probably hundreds of them. It must be very dangerous, but none of them is getting the entire story right. And I think one of the propositions that, that I would make in this presentation is that we, we have some tools that we use to look at ministries of finance, and they are telling us something about them. But what they're telling us about them is not the entire story. That doesn't mean that anything that we write, know right now is literally wrong. It's just that it's not. It's 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 part of a larger whole, and what we are looking at, and what we are choosing to look at, 
might be skewed because of the limitations of the choices that we make in terms of what we want to analyze. And <laughs> one of the things that we've been hearing of quite a bit in the morning was about uh, PFA indicators, um, the great benefit that PFA indicators g give us in terms of enabling people to measure the quality of PFM systems. And of course, PFA indicators tell us something about ministries of finance. They, they tell us that if, if your PFA score for budget credibility is low, somebody is not doing their job quite right. If that job is the job of the Ministry of Finance, then there is a little bit, there's something wrong there. It might be because they are not trying, it might be because they are trying and failing. All of those things we don't know, <coughs> but we're not completely ignorant. And in the course of the next couple of slides, I'm just going to go through some other images representing maybe some other blind people who have a slightly different take on these things and maybe by looking at the combination of these different factors we have a slightly more nuanced and more interesting story to tell. There are not going to be any answers. This is, um, a lot of it is actually work in progress that, that, that we've been working on individually over the last couple of years, collectively with a couple of pieces of research that are underway right now and maybe in a, in a few months or a few, few years excuse me, few years' time, we will be slightly further down the road of being able to say something that is more definitive. Right now, this is very, very tentative, entirely by design, and hopefully that is going to make it slightly easier also for us to talk about because, as, as I said, just because we're sitting here on the panel and telling you guys a story uh, doesn't necessarily mean that we have all the answers, so it's, it's very likely that um, an hour-long discussion is going to yield to some significant insights for us as well. Except for Kenneth, of course, who knows everything already because he is working in the Ministry of Finance himself. Now, the first image, and this is just a little bit of theory that is just worth remembering when you think about Ministries of Finance, why is it that they are so different from just any other ministry? And um, this is going back to some actually fairly, fairly textbookish old work that was done by Patrick Dunleavy in the 1990s, who was distinguishing between the core budget of a ministry, that's the sort of thing that you run yourself, the salaries, the, the, the expenses that you run out of your office, then there's something that he calls a program budget, which is different, which is the budget that you give out, for instance, by procuring large contracts that go to separate uh, companies, those sorts of things, <coughs> some things that you might delegate to agencies. That's the sort of stuff which you're still responsible for. You are on the hook if something goes wrong, but the implementation is not entirely yours. And then finally, there's a category called the super program budget, which is essentially something that is just passing through you. It has something to do with you, but the entire activity in terms of what government actually does, the, the financial management of it, the, the salient decision making, a significant part of the political accountability rests somewhere else. And with just to show how this plays out in three different examples, if you look at a typical Ministry of Defense, there are lots of soldiers whose salaries they pay, lots of civilian staff whose salaries they pay, but they also do gigantic procurement programs, so it's a combination between core and program. If you have a Ministry of Education, it's slightly different. There might be lots of delegation to subnational entities, for instance, where the Ministry of Education still needs to claim and own some of the responsibility, but as far as the money management goes, it's not really theirs at all. And then finally, when you go to the Ministry of Finance, the administrative budget, the, the, the agency budget of a Ministry of Finance is, of course, absolutely tiny if you compare it to the budget of the entire country. And that's where the whole headache for the Ministry of Finance begins, because they, their, their job is to manage something which they can't really manage themselves. <coughs> they don't have the usual incentive that we ascribe to, say, the Ministry of Education, where more is almost inevitably better if you win in budget negotiations and you get more money to spend. That's good times in your ministry. If there's less, then they're not so good. If you're in the Ministry of Finance, you, you <coughs> think about a completely <coughs> different set of issues because you, as an individual official, gain very little from having more money to spend for yourself. Now, I would have thought that this might have been a gratuitous use of a graph that I'm just uh, I just happen to be very fond of. I'm very interested in history and where these things come from originally. Um, Luisa Diogo saved me from the gr gratuity of, of putting the slide in here. If you look at 
the budget institutions in ministries of finance that we know today and where they originate in European countries where that stuff was invented, the idea of having a budget that is predicted by officials in a ministry so that you have revenues that <coughs> broadly match expenditure a year ahead of time, the idea that you have an internal auditor, that you have an external auditor, that you have people who authorize expenditures before they take place, all of these things were invented, so to speak, in their modern form in an environment where 80 to 80%, eighty percent, ninety percent of the spending went exclusively for the military. It's like the Mozambique of the 1990s that we just heard about. And it obviously, the, the, the function that those ministries are meant to perform determines the instruments that are going to be used and that become more popular. A lot of the things that we talk about in terms of the, the modern budget process, parliamentary approval, external accountability, scrutiny by legislature, by, by the probing eyes of the media and those things, they are in, on the other side, of this particular graph, the, the internal workings of government, they, a lot of that was actually fairly set when issues such as accountability came around. There's a different kind of issue, um, problems that you have as soon <coughs> as you have to start dealing with budgetary complexity and when all of a sudden the problem, the most important problem of yours is not to get as many revenues as possible and then make sure that as little as possible of, possible of that leaks away, but it all goes towards one purpose when, when you have, as you did in, in, in Western Europe during the 20th century, all sorts of different things and you need to start reallocating, then maybe you find yourself in a position of austerity where reallocation isn't just dividing up of the additional increment, you actually have to do the least fun thing possible, which is to cut allocations to, to people who <coughs> care about these things very deeply. Again, there are implications for the functional setup of your ministry that are very, very profound. I'm just putting these out there because for, for the, the bulk of the OECD literature, we know this history. We know what the functional needs were and we also know how the story ended because it's been a fairly long time ago. For countries like Mozambique, for instance, or like Liberia, for instance, and in a lot of different countries today, we're sort of guessing, we're, we're making lots of analogies and are saying maybe this is like it was in Europe at that time, maybe there's a thing about the parliament and how they do these things because they also have a thing that is called that. Um, but there's a lot of research that, that might be usefully done and usefully employed to just give more names to these mechanisms and functions that that we sort of assume there, there, um, that there was a story this morning about Ghana's budget being being a facade. Um, there's there are other countries where the budget has been called a theatre, and so um, I think there's there's a lot of useful learning that could be done in this area to just figure out what the what these elements would be, so that we don't always have to rely on European examples to understand stuff. Another dimension and this is shifting gears just a little bit, is to talk about finance ministries as institutions that have particular tools of control that they can use. And they do that partially alternatively to legislatures, they do it partially in complement to legislatures, but it's, it's a perspective that Joachim was talking about when he, was, when he mentioned the von Hagen Index, there's a lot of other work that was done, actually including by Carlos uh, for Latin America, and it goes back to the notion that you can tell what a Ministry of Finance is by the things that it is allowed to do, and what the legislature, in contrast, is not allowed to do. And if you look at this two by two here, where you have legislative budgetary powers on one axis and executive budgetary powers on the other axis, what you can see is that there's an enormous degree of variation between countries, and it's there's, there's clearly some sort of a correlation here that where legislatures are more powerful, ministries of finance tend to be less so. Of course, correlation doesn't mean causation. And, and even for any given level, you can see that on, on, these, on these horizontal lines, there are plenty of countries that for any given X have all sorts of different Ys and vice versa. The implications for, for policy can very often mean that if you are Denmark, your optimal setup for the Ministry of Finance is probably going to be different from the one in the UK. If you are a Westminster country, uh, different from what you would find in a presidential country, and so on and so forth. 
Now the next issue, and this is based on uh, some work that Richard Allen did together with Peter Kurnert, which was never published. Um, so I, I have the great pleasure of referencing something that Richard and I then published afterwards. Um, it's just a, a list of the 18 most common or 17 most common functions that ministries of finance take on from different kinds of fiscal policy, <coughs> monetary policy coordination, intergovernmental fiscal relations, or the technical, transactional, procedural elements of the budget process from collecting revenues, expending money, and so on and so forth. And you can then go from country to country and just say how concentrated, how, how fragmented is this? And, and we've heard a lot of stuff in the morning about if there's a Ministry of Planning, there's a Ministry of Budget and a Ministry of Finance, that might be a problem because they need to coordinate. Um, so if you look at the example here for Uganda, the red color, that is everything that's in the Ministry of Finance. Um, the other colors is responsibilities that sit somewhere else. If you compare that to the case of Nepal, again, red is the Ministry of Finance proper. That striped area is responsibilities that are shared between the Ministry of Finance and other entities, uh, which is actually quite a lot. On, f on first sight, you would say, well, maybe in Nepal there's a little bit of an issue with inter interinstitutional coordination. Might that have something to do with the fiscal performance and the ability of <coughs> ministries of finance to function? But then if you look at Uganda, it's not like everything mm -hmm. is centralized in the Ministry of Finance. Also, a function is not equally uh, the same to any other function. So maybe there are policy functions that need to be centralized, transactional functions maybe not so much, and there are lots of questions that are still worth asking that would probably keep us from saying, let's just do an index of fragmentation, and if that thing is high, then we have an issue. If it's low, then we, had, we don't have to worry about it, and let's move somewhere else. Um, next point here, and this is something that I would really like to emphasize, is this issue of what, it is, what is it that we really mean by capability? Traditionally, when we talk about capability, we mean the analytical heft that an institution has. If there are lots of smart economists who are working there who can analyze lots of different things, they have all the numbers, they can do fantastic projections, that's a capable ministry. If you break this down a little bit, and this is actually based on a workshop that we held here earlier in the year at LSE together with Martin, Lo um, at ODI with Martin Lodge from LSE and a couple of other people, we tried to break this down a little bit more. We're looking at the, the, the regu regulatory capability of ministries, the coordinative capability of ministries. So how do you make sure that different actors do things at a certain time, come together, come to a decision, have a process that you can have move on? Regulatory, how do you regulate the spending behavior of places that are not yourself? And if you look at the job description of a typical Ministry of Finance, you find that actually this analytical capability, sure, it's important, but other people can do that as well. The regulatory and the coordinative capability is something that's just absolutely essential if you want to get a budget done on time, if you want it adhered to after it's been passed, and so on and so forth. The, the attitude of many people who work in ministries of finance is very often it's, you know, it's us against the rest of the world, which is, which is just as well, and there are good reasons for that, but it also means that if the rest of the world doesn't want to listen to you, you're in a little bit of a pickle because you, you cannot necessarily assume that just by exerting formal powers you can make everyone else do what it is that you want. <coughs> Finally, this is the final slide, um, um, there's this issue, and again, I'm, I'm mentioning here the very, very big body of research into public administration that is out there that we don't normally pay a whole lot of attention to when we talk about PFM. There, there's a whole range of issues that thankfully, again, Madame Diogo was, was, was nice enough to spend, uh, talk, speak to a lot better than, than I would ever be able to about career progressions within the civil service, how quickly are people promoted, how many people are retained in the ministry over, over different periods of time, what about the role of merit in, in making appointments and promotion? What about the role of the politicization of the civil service? I'm from Germany myself, which by some comparative measures has some, one of the most politicized civil services in, in Western Europe. Doesn't seem to do us all that much harm in terms of fiscal performance. Um, and then there's finally this issue of competitive pay where 
and we were just drawing a couple of numbers together. Please don't quote them because they're incredibly tentative and probably mostly wrong. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you look at the published figures for salaries in the Ministry of Finance in Uganda, and just compare that to GDP per capita, however inadequate a comparison that is, it's about two thirds if for someone who is at director level. If you look at the comparable numbers for a director general in the German Ministry of Finance and a director in the UK Treasury, it's about 3.5 to five times the GDP <coughs> per capita. Of course, if you then you look at Uganda and see how much somebody is getting paid who is working for an international organization, which is several dozen times, maybe 100 times more than the average G GDP per capita, you get a sense for, of just how difficult it is to make sure that people sort of stay on board, even in an ideal situation where you don't have fragility and conflict and all the rest of it. And I'm going to leave it at that because um, I'm running out of time. I'm, I'm, I was just going to point to a couple of intangible, difficult to measure <laughs> factors that were also mentioned in the discussion before. And um, I have a couple of questions to move the discussion on, but uh, we'll get to that anyway, so I don't have to spell that out. Thank you. Thank you.